Well, good afternoon, everyone. And let me thank you all for being here this afternoon. Uh, I'm joined today uh, by a group of people who represent the outstanding cooperative work and efforts that led to the results that we are announcing this afternoon. Uh, the Deputy Attorney General, Sally Yates, no better leader and friend could an AG have. Uh, the Assistant Attorney General for the Criminal Division, Leslie Caldwell. Assistant Attorney General for the Environment and National Natural Resources Division, John Cruden. Principal Deputy Assistant AG for the Civil Division, Ben Miser. The U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of Michigan, Barbara McQuaid. FBI Deputy Director, Andrew McCabe. EPA Administrator, Gina McCarthy. EPA Assistant Administrator, Cynthia Giles. Department of Homeland Security Acting Deputy Secretary, Russell Dio. Customs and Border Protection Deputy Commissioner, Kevin McAleenan and David Jellius, special agent in charge of the FBI's Detroit Division. I'm not sure there's a portion of the country that I've left out. <laughs> but we are here today to announce a number of significant developments in the federal government's ongoing investigation into Volkswagen's attempts to dodge emission standards and import falsely certified vehicles into this country, an egregious violation of our nation's environmental, consumer protection, and financial laws. Now for years, Volkswagen advertised its vehicles as complying with federal anti-pollution measures, calling them clean diesel. But our investigation has revealed they were anything but. Because in fact, hundreds of thousands of cars that Volkswagen sold in the United States were pumping illegal levels of nitrogen oxides into our atmosphere, up to 40 times more than the amounts permitted under federal law. Now what's more, these vehicles were equipped with software that masked the true amount of the pollutants the cars released, thwarting the regulators who were doing the environmental testing. To be clear, Volkswagen knew of these problems, and when regulators expressed concern, Volkswagen obfuscated, they denied, and they ultimately lied. And today, the Department of Justice the Environmental Protection Agency, and the U.S. Customs and Border Protection have reached a global resolution with Volkswagen that carries both criminal and civil penalties. As part of this resolution, Volkswagen is pleading guilty to three felonies, conspiracy to defraud the United States, to commit wire fraud, and to violate the Clean Air Act, obstruction of justice, and importation of goods by false statements. Now, the agreement also requires Volkswagen to pay $4.3 billion in criminal and civil penalties, one of the largest clean air penalties ever achieved, and also requires them to take specific measures to prevent future violations. These sanctions are in addition to the more than $15 billion in settlements with VW that we've previously announced. And as part of this criminal plea, VW will also be placed on three years probation. It will retain an independent monitor to oversee its ethics and compliance program, and it will fully cooperate with our ongoing investigation into the individuals responsible for these crimes. Furthermore, we are today announcing the indictment of six former high-level Volkswagen executives, Richard Dorenkamp, Bern Gottweiss, Jens Hodler, Heinz Jacob Neuser, Jürgen Peter, and Oliver Schmidt. Now, these individuals all held positions of significant responsibility at Volkswagen, including overseeing the company's engine development division and serving on the company's management board. And over the course of a conspiracy that lasted for nearly a decade, they seriously abused those positions. And today, they are being charged with a range of crimes, including conspiracy to defraud the United States, violations of the Clean Air Act, and wire fraud. Now, today's actions reflect the Justice Department's steadfast commitment to defending consumers, to protecting our environment and our financial system, and holding individuals and companies accountable for corporate wrongdoing. But this announcement does not mean that our investigation is complete. We will continue to examine Volkswagen's attempts to mislead consumers and deceive the government. We will continue to pursue the individuals responsible for orchestrating this damaging conspiracy. And we will continue to vigorously enforce the laws of the United States. Now, of course, this is a group effort, as you can see. It required the ongoing persistence and dedication and skills of a number of agencies and components 
within the Department of Justice and our colleague agencies. And I want to thank all of the men and women from the Department of Justice, from EPA, from Customs and Border Protection, who have worked tirelessly to secure this resolution and who continue to carry this investigation forward. And at this time, I'd like to invite the EPA Administrator, Gina McCarthy, to the podium to say more about today's announcement. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney General Lynch, uh, for all of your tremendous leadership, as well as Assistant Attorneys General John Cruden and Leslie Caldwell for all of their hard work. I am truly proud of the partnership that you see standing before you, especially that between EPA and DOJ in our mutual interest to protect public health and the environment. And I want to thank U.S. Attorney Barbara McQuaid and U.S. Customs and Border Protection for helping to deliver this important settlement today. To our partners at the California Air Resources Board and Environment Canada, I want you to know that we could never have accomplished any of this without your tremendous technical support every step of the way. And it goes without saying how proud I am of the team at EPA including our criminal team led by Special Agent Lance Erig. The team has diligently pursued this case from the start and to all other tireless public servants at EPA working on the Volkswagen case led by Cynthia Giles and Janet McCabe, I want to thank you for your tremendous work. At its core, EPA is a public health agency and the American people demand a strong and active EPA to protect our common right to clean air, clean water, and safe, healthy communities for our families to live and work and to play. This fundamental and indispensable role EPA plays is put into stock relief in moments like this, when companies choose to break our nation's environmental laws and they emit pollution in levels that pose a threat to the health of American families. Selling more than half a million cars with illegal defeat devices is a violation that cannot go unnoticed or unanswered. Today, we mark another milestone in this landmark case that's delivered billions of dollars in Clean Air Act protections. But don't be fooled into thinking that delivering produce, uh, pollution reductions like this is easy. It's not. It's a lot of hard work by men and women who work tirelessly to address these issues, and it takes collaboration between the federal agencies and partnerships with states, tribes, and local communities, and in this case, coordination even with our neighbor to the north, Canada, who has worked alongside us. No, it's not easy, but the work is well worth it. Since 1970, our environmental rules have resulted in cars on the market today that are 99% cleaner and travel more than 10 miles further on a gallon of gasoline, making them better for our health as well as our pocketbooks. And that success has relied on a strong and robust enforcement to deliver on the promise of our rules, including world-class technical and legal expertise to repair the damage that companies like Volkswagen has done to our ear and to the automobile marketplace as a whole, resulting from false claims of cleaner diesels. You know, markets like this don't manage or police themselves to ensure that the products they produce protect the health and well-being of the people that we care about. We as a society do that. That's why we have environmental laws. That's what they are all about. And that's why EPA focuses so much attention on compliance and why we have cops on the beat so cheating doesn't pay and polluters are held accountable for the costs of their noncompliance. This past summer, I stood here and outlined how we had delivered a settlement that required Volkswagen to spend $14.7 billion to get the polluting cars off the road, to fund projects to reduce pollution across the country, and to promote the growth of zero emission vehicles in the United States. Last month, we delivered again when EPA and DOJ announced that another 83,000 three-liter cars would be recalled as well as to require an additional $225 million to cut harmful NOx pollution. That brings the total to nearly $3 billion that will be put to use by states to cut pollution in communities. Now today we're delivering again for the American people. Volkswagen is admitting to crimes for lying to EPA and deliberately evading their obligations under the Clean Air Act. 
individuals with Volkswagen are being charged to show that serious crimes have serious consequences, both for the company and for the managers who cheat. Volkswagen will pay a combined total of $4.3 billion in criminal and civil penalties for their failure to follow the law that protects our clean air. Additionally, we're requiring certain corporate actions to ensure it doesn't happen again. Today, EPA is once again delivering for the American people. We're showing that our laws have teeth and that companies that break the rules will be held accountable. That's what the public expects from EPA. And that's how we will help level the playing field for all the responsible companies who always do the right thing. We all have a basic right to breathe clean air, and EPA is there to protect that right. Thank you. Now I'll turn it over to De Deputy Director McCabe. Okay. Oh, here we are. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon. And thank you all for being here. This announcement is the culmination of a 16-month criminal investigation. And that investigation began when researchers at the West University of West Virginia were awarded a grant to study diesel cars from the International Council on Clean Transportation. During their study, they found that despite Volkswagen's claims that their clean diesel cars were among the most fuel-efficient and environmentally friendly, the numbers just did not add up. The researchers tested and retested, and they asked Volkswagen officials some tough questions. At first, Volkswagen officials denied any wrongdoing, but they now admit that the company created illegal software to defeat pollution tests and to make it look like the cars were emitting far less pollution than they actually were. Volkswagen's actions defrauded the United States government defrauded the United States people, and violated the Clean Air Act. It is now clear that Volkswagen's top executives knew about this illegal activity and deliberately kept regulators, shareholders, and consumers in the dark. And they did this for years. So why does this matter to us? Well, it matters for many reasons. American investors expect that when they choose to invest in a publicly traded corporation, the corporation is operating in a transparent manner. They have to believe the information the corporation provides to the investors is accurate and truthful. Consumers also expect that companies tell the truth about their products. So if environmentally conscious buyers are told they're purchasing green cars, they should actually be getting, in fact, green cars, not cars that spew out pollution in excess of federal and state regulations. And the environmental impact is real, and there are economic impacts as well. These crimes threaten the integrity of our financial markets, they defraud our consumers, and they hurt the environment. And as a result, people are hurt. Today's settlement announcement means that Volkswagen is pleading guilty to criminal charges. So as you all know, we can't put companies in jail, but we can hold their employees personally accountable and we can force companies to pay hefty fines. Settlements like today's shine a harsh light on illegal behavior, and we believe they have a powerful deterrent effect as well. We, along with our law enforcement and regulatory partners, will continue to hold responsible those companies that break the law, misrepresent their products, endanger financial markets, and defraud customers. So a few thanks uh, before I go. I'd like to thank in particular our Detroit field office, which led the FBI's investigative efforts for this case, and of course our criminal investigative division here at FBI headquarters. But I also want to take an opportunity to thank our federal partners in this investigation, including, of course, the DOJ fraud section, the environmental crime section, the EPA's criminal investigative division, the Department of Homeland Security, and the Customs and Border Protection Service. Big cases like these do not happen without collaboration and partnership. And this case is an extraordinary example of that sort of collaboration in its absolutely most productive sense. So finally, before I finish, just one final word. This case is also a great example of the fact that no corporation is too big 
No corporation is too global. No person is beyond the law. We will continue to take on these complicated, challenging investigations, and we will pursue them as far as we must to bring justice for the victims involved. So thank you very much, and thanks to my partners again. And now I'll turn it over to Russ Dale. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Director McCabe. I'm pleased to be here on behalf of the Department of Homeland Security. First, I want to join my colleagues in thanking the Department of Justice, the Environmental Protection Agency, and all of our federal partners for their work on this important case. It really was and is a model of collaboration. I also want to thank the CBP's Office of Chief Counsel. Along with the Office of Trade and Office of Field Operations, the legal team has worked tirelessly to reach these settlements. They truly are to be commended for their outstanding work. U.S. Customs and Border Protection enforces over 400 laws on behalf of 40 other U.S. government agencies. These laws protect our economic and homeland security, as well as the health and safety of U.S. consumers. Volkswagen's actions over the course of many years violated criminal and civil U.S. customs laws. Through a combination of false statements and omissions, Volkswagen fraudulently represented to CBP that nearly 590,000 vehicles complied with all applicable environmental laws. The $4.3 billion criminal and civil penalties that Volkswagen has agreed to pay demonstrate how seriously the U.S. government views these violations. The civil penalty imposed on Volkswagen to satisfy CBP's and EPA claims is the largest under the custom laws in U.S. history. The largest under U.S. history. CBP's relationship with the importer community is based on trust. These settlements demonstrate that CBP will not tolerate the breach of that trust or violations of U.S. custom laws. We work closely with the importer community and consider them to be valued partners. But importers who wish to trade in the United States have responsibilities. There are consequences for those who seek to defraud the United States and introduce prohibited merchandise. Again, let me thank our federal partners for working together to reach this resolution. And finally, let me also acknowledge CBP's officers and agents in trade enforcement. At ports here in the United States and across the world, they work every day to protect American citizens and the American economy against threats to our security. Thank you very much. Thank you, Russ. Thank you. Thank you, Russ, and to all of our speakers and for questions. Paula and then uh, the first question could be for you or Deputy Attorney General uh, Sally Yates. I have two questions. Um, so usually the Department of Justice is criticized for not putting cuffs on individuals in corporate cases, but here you got six. Why is that? Is that the fruit of the Yates memo? What was different here? Well, look, I think you saw the, the fruits of, of a wonderful investigative team, and certainly there's been a continued emphasis on holding individuals accountable, which has always been the focus of the Department of Justice, whether you're in the U.S. Attorney's Office or whether you're here. If you look through the history of the corporate cases, you will see individuals being held accountable as well. I don't know, Sally, the question was partly at you. Did you? Well, well far be it for me to jump in here. <laughs> um, you need a microphone. I think what you saw today, I recall after the Volkswagen case was announced, the investigation was announced, a lot of folks, a lot of commentators, maybe some of you, um, were saying, well, this is going to tell us whether or not this new policy is real or whether it's just a paper policy. And I think the fact that we are announcing charges today against six high-ranking executives at Volkswagen, not just six employees, but six high-ranking executives at Volkswagen, demonstrates that this is not just a paper policy. This is really a reflection of the fact that faceless multinational corporations don't commit crimes. Flesh and blood people commit crimes. And that we've sharpened our focus to ensure that we're doing everything from the very beginning of an investigation, not at the end, but from the very beginning of an investigation, to hold those individuals accountable and build out from there. And so you see an indictment of six individuals today and a corporate resolution is for Mr. McCabe. Um, 
What, if anything, can you tell us about the FBI's efforts to investigate the president-elect or his associates and their ties to Russia? Yeah, I'm not here to discuss that today, so well, it is, it is not the news of the day. It is the topic of the day. Um, but a follow-up, I mean, even members of the Intelligence Committee have said that there is some sort of inquiry there. If that closes with no charges, will you make a public accounting and, and clear him as you did with Secretary Clinton? I understand it's the news of the day, just not the news of this press conference, so I'm going to not comment on that. Thanks. Uh, uh, General uh, Dave Shepardson from Reuters. Uh, five of the six people you charged are in Germany. What are the prospects for their returning, given our treaty obligations with Germany? Secondly, uh, did you find any evidence that the misconduct was higher than that? Any members of the Board of Management, either current or former? And would you anticipate bringing charges against Martin Wintercorn or any other higher level executives? So what I can say about that is, as you correctly note, five of the six individuals are currently outside the U.S. They are in Germany. Um, and I will say that we've always worked very well with our German colleagues uh, on various law enforcement matters. It's too early to predict right now how matters will be resolved there. We have had a number of cases in other matters uh, where we have been able to reach resolution with individuals. And so I won't speculate on that right now because it's too early in that process. Uh, with respect to other individuals, other people, or other parts of um, this investigation, as I indicated in my remarks, this investigation is ongoing. It will continue, and um, we will continue to look at individuals, and because of that, we're not able to comment on anyone in particular. So I thank you for that. What do you think went wrong, ultimately? Was this a, a, a failure in the culture of the company, or was it just a decision to, to break the, the law or, or, or cheat to move ahead in the U.S. market? You know, I don't want to speculate on, on motivations other than the profit motive, obviously. Um, you know, Volkswagens are very popular cars. There's a large market for them. And certainly there's a large market for clean cars, particularly clean diesel cars. And the U.S. is, is a market that's growing in that as well. Um, what I would say is that this is a case that illustrates um, a company that, at very high levels, um, knew of this problem and deliberately chose to continue with this fraudulent behavior. Uh, and that's one reason why the actions taken here are so severe and do devolve on individuals. We work with companies all the time who present to us situations where they may say it's a particular unit over here or the quintessential rogue employee. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's larger. We look at all of those factors as well. But here we saw a company where this knowledge and, and the choice that they made went to the executive level, and that did set it apart from other companies. Gina? Thank you, Attorney General. Uh, Dave, just a, another factor. I, I, I'd take a look at the injunctive relief that required from the corporation mm -hmm. because it, it, it actually requires things like separating the individuals that design vehicles from those that test them. So there are some structural changes that we're requiring so that there's less ability for these types of things to happen. And so I'd take a look at that. It requires independent audits. It requires a committee to be established in Volkswagen. It requires additional testing of vehicles. So part of this could it certainly, we know the intent in terms of the cover-up, but how it happened could have been also a result of the way in which the company structured its, its business. And we have asked them, and they have agreed, to make some significant changes in how the corporation operates in order to make it less able to have these types of problems arise in the future. I'm just curious, I'm just curious whether you watched, watched uh, Senator Sessions' confirmation hearings yesterday, how you thought he did, if you had any discussions with him over the course of the last few months, and what advice you'd give him upon taking this job? Well, that's a lot. Um, I was only able to see the hearings off and on due to the press of other business and travel, uh, so I don't have a comment on the, on the hearings or how he did, nor would that be appropriate for me to make. I can tell you that my conversation with Senator Sessions was uh, early on and simply a congratulatory uh, and holiday call uh, when his nomination was announced, and, but beyond that, nothing, no. So. What advice would you give him? You know, I don't, um, I will say that, that um, you know, I've been asked that in the past also, and I, I don't give specific advice uh, to the incoming Attorney General. What we are doing is working very well with the transition team that has been at the department for several weeks now, working extensively with components and leadership um, to let them know not only the wonderful work that we're doing, as evidenced by the case you see 
here today and other cases, uh, but also um, the depth and breadth of talent here at the department, uh, and to also talk about the initiatives that we have found to be successful and helpful and point them to evidence that they could look to to see their efficacy so that they can make the decisions going forward. So we are working and we are committed, as the President has directed, to ensuring a smooth transition. Uh, the Department of Justice transition is going very well, uh, and so that's how we're handling that. I promise to come back here. Thank you. Uh, this does appear to be the largest criminal fine ever levied against an automaker. Uh, larger than two recent cases where the automaker had safety flaws that resulted in fatalities. Yes. Does that speak to the level of premeditation and cover-up with Volkswagen? What was different here? Well, I'll ask uh, Leslie Caldwell to speak to that if you, if you want to. Um, I will say, as we discussed, however, we did see um, a level of knowledge and intent in this company that de definitely set it apart. Leslie? Thank you. So yes, I think you hit on it partly. The level of premeditation was very significant here, and that was at a very high level of the company. Uh, also, this is a company where lower level people actually expressed concern along the way about the fact that these defeat devices were being used and questioned whether they should be used, and higher up people decided to continue using them. And then, of course, Volkswagen lied to the regulators and, and, and also obstructed justice once our investigation started. So I think that's really what distinguishes this. And we don't really see many major multinational corporations that decide at a very high level, as the Attorney General said, as opposed to in some far-flung unit, to knowing what the U.S. law is, to violate the U.S. law in a systematic way for, as she said, nearly a decade. Quick follow-up. Volkswagen CEO said last year that this was a couple of rogue engineers responsible for this. Your investigation appears to dismember that. Can, can you add detail on just how high in the company you believe this conspiracy went? So as the Attorney General said, we're continuing the investigation, but it, the allegations in the indictment include individuals who are very senior in the company, including one individual who oversaw more than or approximately 10,000 people. So these are very significant people within the company. Evan, then I'll come back to you. Hand was up first. Right. Right. Yes, ma'am. Oh, Sorry. Yeah. Hi. Ellen Nakashima with Washington Post. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Little questions um, from my financial editor. Uh, just to clarify, so this is you consider these senior or high-ranking executives who were uh, charged, and you anticipate? Do you anticipate that there will be additional, even higher-level? executives being charged out of this? I mean, how high up does this conspiracy go? Well, because the investigation is still open and it is ongoing, um, we are not able to comment on anyone else in particular, uh, but I will stress that we are looking at individuals uh, who, who were involved and would have had knowledge of the same information that's currently being charged. More senior than those charged. We don't describe them. I'm not going to speculate on that. So. And does the three-year probation include just the independent monitor or restrictions on businesses in the U.S.? Businesses. I'll have Leslie give you some specifics on that. The question was, does the probation include just the monitor or other business restrictions? And then, so the, the, the independent monitor is, is something that is going to be imposed on Volkswagen for up to three years. At the same time, the Volkswagen is going to have to comply with a lot of additional um, restrictions and directives from the, from the environmental side of the case, and those things are joined at the hip. So we anticipate there will be one monitor overseeing compliance on the criminal side and on the environmental side. Um, and there are very significant restrictions. Volkswagen is also required to continue its cooperation in the government's investigation and the types of cooperation that it's required to continue are laid out in the documents. Thank you. And final question for you, General Lynch. Uh, were you aware of fully aware of all of the documents that were briefed uh, to President Obama and uh, President-elect Trump last week? Well, what I'll say about that is, as I've said in the past, as you know, the President ordered a review from the intelligence community um, of information relating to the issue of Russian attempts to gain some sort of influence or traction within our election. Um, and certainly we participated in that review, and so we were able to provide that report to the President 
as well as to members of Congress, and then we were able to provide the um, unclassified version to the public so that people could be aware um, of the importance and significance of these issues. And that, the version that went to the President and to President-elect Trump included a two-page appendix or synopsis. You're aware of that as well. So but I'm not going to comment on the specifics of anything, of anything in a classified briefing. Um, as you know, we don't discuss those specifics. But what I can say is that the report that the President asked for was completed and was provided to him, as well as to members of Congress. Uh, and then the, the unclassified version was made available to the public. So. And then Evan, and then I'll come back. From watching the hearing, uh, Attorney General Lynch, uh, the hearings yesterday for the incoming, the, the next uh, Attorney General, uh, the the impression we get is that he believes strongly that that there's got to be a turning of the page with regard to uh, the relationship with police departments around the country. It appears to be an inherent criticism of the way your department has handled those relationships and and the handling of civil rights investigation. Would you care to tell us what you view as uh, perhaps a defense of your of the way you've handled it? Well, again, I don't have a comment on um, any of the comments the Senator made in the hearing, nor would I characterize them in any particular way. Um, I think that the issue of police and community relations is an important one uh, for everyone to consider, uh, at, regardless of whether you're in the department, out of the department, or soon to come in uh, to the department. And what I would say to anyone looking at these issues is to talk to the police community, talk to the law enforcement community, talk to community members, um, talk to people who've worked with us on these matters, um, and learn about the positive and strong working relationship that we have with law enforcement across the country in terms of providing support, both technical assistance, both financial, um, help with body-worn cameras, help with equipment, uh, help with benefits for officers who are tragically cut down, as well as help with policy. Uh, police departments come to the department very often and ask us for help. Collaborative reform is a way in which that is very, very often done. That has been an expansion and a growth in the practice, frankly, that I have seen from my early days in the department when I first worked on these matters in the 1990s. It's been a very, very positive development. So we look forward to providing um, the new Attorney General and his team with that information so that they too can have the benefit of all of that information and the changes and all of the, uh, all the ways in which we've been able to craft a stronger relationship. That also includes holding law enforcement accountable and helping them hold themselves accountable. It includes empowering communities and helping them learn how to interact with police in terms of working at the local level on getting involved in policy, getting involved in training, uh, crafting the relationships that have, that have led to improvement in a number of communities. Those of you who covered my community policing tour know that I could talk about this uh, endlessly, but will not for all of our benefit. Um, but we, we took uh, great pains to highlight places that had had very challenged relationships, but have worked very, very hard to in fact improve those relationships and uh, present as, as uh, situations where both law enforcement and community can come together. It doesn't mean that there's not more work to be done. As I said, we look forward to sharing that information with the incoming team as well, so that they can also work on these issues. Agree then that, that, that the, the portrayal of, of your department as being sort of anti-police and being too quick to embrace the criticisms of police, you, you disagree with that? Well, you know, again, I'm not, I don't comment or characterize anyone else's views. I would say that is not how uh, we have carried ourselves. It's not how we have worked with law enforcement across this country. And as I said, we look forward to sharing the information on that practice with the incoming team so that they also uh, can learn from the progress of several years. Hey, uh, Josh Gerstein with Politico. Josh. I wanted to follow up on the questions you meant about the report on possible interference in the election. You mentioned its significance and the importance of giving information to the public. Um, is that sort of it? It just gets put out as a, a public report and, and people can evaluate it as they see fit? Or is there some sort of ongoing effort to get to the bottom of it? Because some of it seems to indicate things that are illegal under US law to break into people's email accounts and so forth. And uh, would you consider, before you leave office, appointing a special counsel who would look into this? Because it seems no matter which campaigns were involved, political appointees are going to inevitably be involved. Uh, it seems like one of the simplest things might be to try to appoint someone who's above reproach to look into it and determine whether there's anything that can be prosecuted here. 
So what I'll say you, with respect to actions that will be taken arising out of the report, as we discussed previously, the report itself is one of the actions we've taken in response to this situation. The public disclosure and the public attribution uh, of a nation state's attempts to involve themselves in our electoral system is something that we take very, very seriously. And as we've discussed previously, when in October, when the intelligence community first um, made this attribution, we noted that we rarely do these types of attributions for a variety of reasons, but it was important to do so in this case. We also noted, uh, and the President has stated, that um, the United States will have a response to these actions. Some of those responses will be visible and some of them will not be visible. Reporting has already ha occurred on many of the responses that we have taken, but as the President has indicated, you may not necessarily see every action that will be taken in response to that. With respect to ongoing investigations, uh, which have been previously discussed also, we don't comment on those, and so we're not able to give you any kind of update on that, except that that work does continue. And what about putting it beyond the reach of politics by naming a special prosecutor or an independent person to review this matter? You know, Commenting on the specifics of any investigation or matter, I would, I would say that, that I continue to have the utmost confidence in the career men and women of the Department of Justice, of the FBI, of the Department of Homeland Security, and all the agencies that will be called to bear, as well as the career dedicated employees of the intelligence community. I promise. Yes, my question. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Without commenting on any specifics or matter, uh, what responsibility do you believe the Justice Department and the FBI have to tell the public what's going on when the president or people very close to the president are being investigated? You know, I think obviously um, we've discussed the fact that we don't comment on, on uh, ongoing matters. We've also discussed the fact that we try and keep the public informed as it is appropriate. That is a case-by-case -case determination and depends very, very much on the facts of every situation. So uh, it's impossible to give you uh, a blanket policy there, uh, except to say that we, we work um, independently and we work uh, in confidence um, to follow facts and law. Uh, and as we indicated with respect to the, to the Russian matter, there are a number of things that go on that uh, we don't discuss publicly. So unfortunately, I don't think I'm able to answer the question as asked. I can tell you that um, information is conveyed to individuals if we think they, have, they may be a victim, obviously, of, of any type of influence. Um, and so we do that, we evaluate every situation very, very carefully. When you make the evaluations, is that the Justice Department's call or is that the FBI's call? We work as a team, and so I won't go into specifics there, but everything would have to be evaluated. And again, every situation is so different uh, there. But, um, so that's all I'm able to give you on that. Here and then come Thank you. Uh, looking at the uh, homicide data in uh, uh, Chicago specifically, the numbers there continue to climb, um, and you know, last year's numbers were, as reported, staggering. Um, what do you view uh, is behind those numbers? Has the DOJ or any of its components reached out to members of CPD to offer any federal assistance? And on the other side, um, the pattern or practice investigation that DOJ is undertaking now, is there any kind of timeline uh, as to when that might be released? Okay. So with respect to your, to your last question, I'm not able to comment on the timing of that investigation except to say that it is a matter that uh, both people here at Maine Justice and the U.S. Attorney's Office in Chicago have been working on very diligently with the city, with the police department, um, and so uh, you know we do we do intend to uh, to push through and and give the city give the city of Chicago both law enforcement and the communities um, the help that um, that they deserve so that they can in fact work on these issues. But I'm not able to comment on timing with respect to the the violent crime issue in Chicago. Um, it, I think it's it's part of a larger th a pattern that we're looking at where we see upticks in violence in any particular city. We are working with Chicago with specific measures. Chicago has been a part of what is called our Violence Reduction Network, and that is a program that we have here at the Department of Justice that um, works directly with the police department, elected officials, um, as well as uh, individuals who work, uh, depending upon the specific issue, maybe in the community or in other areas, to, to look at the root causes of violence. And we, we gather a lot of information from our local partners there and marshal federal resources there. Um, the Violence Reduction Network is up and running in a number of cities that have seen this spike, and Chicago is one of them. We are working very closely with the Chicago Police Department on such matters as, as uh, 
for example, without going into a lot of specifics because it's ongoing, um, that looking at um, how they handle the intelligence involving homicides and, and gang data and providing what information, insider resources they may find useful there. Um, making sure that they have access to other law enforcement resources, other cities that have been in similar situations, for example, uh, that have been able to tackle this issue. Um, and so we've had, in fact, uh, an ongoing effort with them, as well as providing the police department through our grant program and through the COPS office with additional resources as well, both in the, in the, in the sense of allowing them to hire additional officers. We've recently provided a COPS grant that will allow them to hire additional police officers as well as obtain more equipment. One more question. This will be the last question. Yes, my name is Mark Boschetti. I'm a reporter with MLEX. Yes. I'd like to ask about remediation. This is an area where the department has been focusing more. Uh, did the department seek personnel changes at VW uh, in VW management as part of this settlement? And do you expect VW to make management changes now? So again, I'll, I will have Leslie Caldwell address this, the specifics of that question. Uh, but as far as future efforts, again, we won't comment on that because the investigation is ongoing and we are continuing to look at the company and individuals. But let me ask uh, Leslie to respond to that. So we did not, and as we generally do not, ask companies to make specific remedial changes at, about personnel. But Volkswagen has made a lot of changes internally. They have terminated some people, they have suspended other people, they have disciplined other people. And they've also changed the structure of parts of their company uh, and their management and their board. So significant changes have been made and the uh, plea agreement with Volkswagen, as, as you'll see, outlines some additional changes that will be happening in the future. Thank you all very much.